Hello everyone, I am Nick Butts and this is the Nick Butts Chess Channel which I started uh, less than two months ago. And also today this is the 150th video and recently I asked viewers and subscribers to vote on who is the greatest chess player of all time. And there are many choices, uh, Magnus Carlsen, uh, Bobby Fischer, Gary Kasparov, Capablanca, Paul Morphy, um, but I received the most votes for Mikhail Tall, who is uh, one of the greatest attacking chess players of all time. And so today I will feature uh, three games by Mikhail Tall. I'll try to go through these quickly. The first one is a shorter game. Uh, and so let's begin here. Uh, this first game took place in 1973, so 50 years ago. And let's see here. So this game began with Mikhail Tall playing with the white pieces against Raphael Vaganian uh, in, let's see, where was this? Played in Russia. And so Tall begins with e4 an attacking move, controlling the center here, and e6 is the response, the French defense. And so after d4, d5, <clears throat> we have knight to d2, which uh, instead of moving to c3 to protect this e4 pawn, the knight moves to d2 so as not to block the c pawn, which uh, could move up to c3 and help defend this d4 pawn in case uh, black decides to play c5, which happens often in the French defense. And so here, this is an interesting variation. Knight to c6 is played, attacking this pawn here, but blocking in the c pawn. Usually the c pawn is pushed forward and then the knight is brought out. Um, so we have knight to f3 by tall, and then uh, knight to f6, putting more pressure on this pawn here on e4. And the pawn moves forward, attacking the knight, and the knight retreats back to d7 here. And so now this knight moves out of the way of the bishop up here to b3 to help fortify this d4 pawn and possibly this knight could jump up into the queen side here on blacks uh, into blacks side uh, all right now we have f6 here attacking the central pawn uh, since the c pawn cannot move up and attack the base of the pawn chain uh, the next thing to do is attack the top of the pawn chain here and so in response, Tall ignores this move and moves his bishop up here to b5, attacking the knight. And also, if there are exchanges, uh, one of the knights could end up pinned to the king. And so after capture, pawn captures, um, now we have this knight moving up here to attack. And then knight to g5 is played. So ignoring what black is doing here, tall jumps up into black's kingside position. And let's see what happens next. Bishop to d7, blocking or breaking this pin of the knight to the king. And then the bishop captures. We have pawn capture. And now the queen jumps up with check here to h5. And so after a block, the queen repositions back down to f3. And here, black has resigned as the best move here is queen to e7, which would uh, help prevent this checkmate threat here. But then this knight 
would be captured here on c5. So immediately Tall spotted the problem uh, in this setup by Black and exploited it, attacking, and now a piece will be lost here. So if we look at those moves, Queen to e7 uh, is the best move to cover this checkmate threat. And then after uh, Knight takes c5 here, In this position, it looks like, let's see, if h6 is played, oh, excuse me, h6, and then, oh, that's not what they wanted here. Hmm, let me go back. After h6, then queen to d3, to threaten another attack, capturing this pawn and checking. Um, then rook to g8, and then queen, or excuse me, knight takes d7, queen takes d7. Anyway, uh, before I dive too deep into this, Tall came out ahead. Uh, he was ahead of peace, and so he should be winning eventually in this position. And so now, let's move on to the second game here, uh, which takes place in uh, what year? 1959. So this game is between Bobby Fischer with the white pieces and Tall uh, with the black pieces. And this is a candidates tournament. So... Here it looks like Tall wins this game and would go on uh, to fight in the World Championship. So Tall became World Champion, I believe, in 1960 by defeating Mikhail Botvinnik. And then they had a rematch in which Botvinnik won then in the rematch. But let's see how this game plays out. So Fisher with E4 attacking. And a counterattack by Tall with c5, the Sicilian defense, and then knight to f3, which will support a d4 pawn push in the center. And d6 is played to cover this e5 square. That way the knight can be brought out to f6 and not worry about this pawn coming forward and attacking the knight, because now this pawn on d6 covers this square. And so d4 is played. And capture and the knight captures. And here we see in the Sicilian defense, the strategy for black is to keep his two center pawns to white's one center pawn. But white has a little bit of a space advantage here and uh, a little lead in development. But now after knight to f6 attacking the e pawn we have knight to c3 to defend and then a6 here the nydorf variation of the sicilian defense and this move keeps pieces out of this b5 uh, square and could support a pawn push to b5 later in the game and so bishop to c4 and so this move lines up on this f7 pawn that is only protected by the king. So in many openings, uh, this is a theme attacking the weak f7 pawn. And so here we have e6 blocking this attack on the f pawn and also this e6 move. Uh, this pawn can cover d5 and e5 here. And so the bishop retreats here as it was unprotected on the c4 square and also b5 could be played attacking the pawn. So this pawn, or, or excuse me, attacking the bishop with the pawn. So the bishop retreats back and keeps an eye on this line towards black's kingside. So Tall responds with bishop to e7. So he kind of fortifies his position here, and he's ready to castle kingside. 
And now f4 is played, where white gains space on the king side here, and these pawns can support each other if one or the other pushes forward. And castling king side by black. And now queen to f3 is played. So from here, the queen will have uh, a spot to support a g4 pawn push uh, or an f5 pawn push, or even if this pawn on e4 is pushed forward after b5 is played, the queen will have a attack diagonal here up to the rook on a8. So there's a lot going on in the Sicilian defense. It's a pretty tactical opening, a fighting, counterattacking uh, defense for black. And so here we have queen to c7, which will help uh, keep an eye on this b7 square. So if this pawn is pushed forward and white pushes forward here attacking the knight, and the rook at the same time, the bishop will be able to move here to b7, protected by this queen and attacking white's queen. So the Sicilian is a pretty tricky uh, tactical opening. So if you like a lot of attacking games and counterattacking, the Sicilian may be your choice for uh, a defense as black. All right, castling by white here on the king side. So they both castled on the same side and now the rook and queen are lined up here. And Tall plays b5, attacking on the queen side, uh, possibly threatening to push forward and drive this knight away. And so the queen side attack is ignored by Fisher and he pushes forward with f5 here, attacking this center pawn. And Tall ignores what Fisher is doing and counterattacks on this knight on c3. And then we have the knight moving up here uh, to the edge of the board. But this will block this pawn here. And also the knight is protected by this bishop. And perhaps at some point the knight could jump back into the game on b5 possibly. Uh, or a pawn push here, and the knight can support if this pawn captures. So a lot going on in this position. And now e5 is played attacking the knight, but leaving a backwards d pawn here. And so we'll have to see if this d pawn becomes a weakness or not. So the knight retreats, and now bishop to b7 is played attacking uh, this pawn, lining up on the queen, and the knight is also attacking the pawn. So Fisher defends with knight to g3, helping to cover this e4 pawn. And then after a developing knight move by Tall, we have bishop development and covering this diagonal uh, to help protect against checks on the white king. And now the bishop moves here and attacks the knight, but at the present, this knight is uh, defended by the bishop here. And so a bishop retreat back here uh, where it gets out of the way of the queen and it helps consolidate and defend on the king side. And now the queen maneuvers over to b7, forming a battery with bishop and queen attacking this e4 pawn. Also the knight is attacking. So three attackers and at the present only two defenders. And so the rook moves to help add another defender to this e4 pawn. And now another attacker, d5, is played, putting more pressure on this important central e4 pawn. So Fisher attacks, capturing the pawn, and then we have a knight jumping into the action, into the center of the board here. And now Fisher responds by blocking this pawn from being able to move forward in the future, but also placing his knight in the center, 
where possibly it can help with some attack on Black's position. And now the knight repositions down to f4 into White's king side, but also now that the knight is moved, we have the bishop and queen battery attacking this knight and pinning that knight to the queen. And so Fisher responds with c4 here. And now ignoring this move, g6 is played, attacking this pawn. And so now Fisher captures and ignoring that capture, Tall responds with f5. And we see now the game has jumped and it's uh, quite a bit over two and a half pawns worth in black's favor here. And so white is in trouble. This knight is pinned to the queen and attacked by a pawn here. So a push forward here with g7, attacking the rook. Tall captures, and now we have a queen move here, checking the black king, uh, getting out of this pin on the knight. And after a move by the king, now we have the knight jumping up to c5, attacking the queen and uh, attacking the knight here. But after capture, 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 and capture, we have the queen moving and another queen move here to e3, putting pressure on this central pawn. But now the position is even more in white's, or excuse me, black's favor, almost plus or minus four. So the equivalent of four pawns in favor of black here. And so if we look at the material, it looks like five, five pawns to five. So the material is even here. But white is behind uh, with the computer evaluation by four pawns worth of material. And we'll see why here as the game continues. Um, rook at A to E8, protecting this pawn, um, preventing a check and trade of queens here. Um, and now... Interesting, Fisher plays rook to e2 here, which looks like it would allow a capture of this rook. So if we go back and see what the computer recommends, uh, knight capturing on a6, attacking the queen here. But after rook to e2 played in the game, now, uh, it swings even more in black's favor. And now we just have a capture of that rook. So it's hard to understand why Fisher made that move. Maybe he was just trying to get that knight out of his position, even if he had to give up material. Queen captures, um, bishop captures, and white is just in trouble now. Um, capture of the pawn attacking the queen. Um, the queen moves over with a check. And now the king captures, moving and check. And the king is being cornered here. So now trapped on the H file here. Fisher is running out of options. And after queen here threatening to come down here and mate on h6, which Fisher could block, but then the queen would be captured. Um, we have bishop to d1, trying to uh, reinforce this queen, but then rook to e6 is played, where this rook can swing over, and the only way to stop the mate is to give up the queen here, to block with the queen. And so Mikhail Tall, defeats Bobby Fisher here and Bobby Fisher 
could also be considered one of the greatest chess players of all time. Uh, although he was younger here, um, in 1959, he was still a teenager. So this was the beginning of Bobby Fischer's career. And in, at this period, it was um, probably early in Tall's career, but he was at the top of his game uh, during this period. He would go on um, in 1960. He became the world champion. Mikhail Tall did. Uh, Fisher, of course, became the world champion in 1972. So Fisher is improving here, uh, but Tall just stopped Fisher in his tracks, winning this game. All right, uh, we'll go on to one final game here between... Mikhail Tall and Mikhail Botvinnik, both former world champions. And this game takes place in the world championship match of 1961. And I believe this was the year that the rematch occurred. I think Tall won in 1960. And in 1961, Botvinnik had a rematch and took his title back from Tall. Um, so... This should be a very interesting game. Um, I'll have to check those numbers, but I think that was correct. That Tall was the world champion, or excuse me, Mikhail Botvinnik was the world champion, and Tall defeated him in 1960, and then Mikhail Botvinnik won the rematch in 1961. Um, and I believe Tall in this rematch played... Uh, much more defensive positional games and steered the games into positional uh, situations where Mikhail Tall could not use his attacking powers as much against Botvinnik. And so that's how Botvinnik ended up winning. And also, Tall would probably have been an even greater... Um, you know, he was a great player, but he probably would have been even better if he didn't have so many health issues. Um, Tall often had health problems that affected his affected him throughout his career. So his career, who knows how much better it would have been uh, if he didn't have those health issues recurring throughout his career. All right, let's begin this game here. So we have Tall with the white pieces facing Botvinnik, the year is 1961, and they're in Moscow. And e4 is played and c6, a positional defensive opening uh, by black. So this is the Karakhan defense. And now e5 is played, the advanced variation. So here, instead of leaving the pawns in the center, uh, white moves a pawn twice in the opening, and usually you don't want to do that. But in this position, he gains more space in the center and kind of restricts black's position here. And not wanting to remain too cramped, Botvinnik counterattacks here by moving his pawn twice in the opening to c5 and attacking this d4 pawn. And now after capture, we have e6 being played, which defends the d5 pawn, and it releases this bishop, which now has an attack threat on the c5 pawn. And so after queen to g4, uh, this move will keep pressure on this pawn. So now the bishop does not want to try and capture here because the queen could recapture and go after the rook. And so we have knight to c6, developing the knight towards the center, and white does the same here. And now the queen lines up here on this pawn. So we have queen and knight putting pressure on this central e5 pawn. And also the queen can help attack this pawn on c5 as well. And now a pin, bishop to b5, pinning this knight, so preventing 
the attacks on these pawns because now this knight cannot move and uh, the knight cannot capture here, cannot move out of the way so the queen could attack this pawn. So a good move, of course, by Mikhail Tall. And now breaking the pin with bishop to d7. Now the knight is free to move once again. So we have capture. Queen captures now attacking this pawn. And bishop to e3, protecting the pawn on c5 here. And so now uh, knight to h6 is played. Uh, once again, you don't normally want to put a knight on the edge of the board where it has less mobility. But this move uh, attacks the queen, forcing white to decide what to do here. And so Tall captures the knight, which breaks apart the kingside pawns here, creating weaknesses. And now the other knight develops to d2 here. And we have queen captures. Um, and an interesting move here. Uh, instead of swinging his knight up to attack the queen, uh, which then the queen could have just captured this pawn, uh, or castling c4 is played and this move very interesting it attacks the center pawn of blacks here on d5 and this pawn was under attack so by jumping forward it forces black to make some decision here so he ignores what's going on castles queen side Kingside castling occurs. So now we have an interesting opposite side castling position. And when that happens, uh, usually pawns are pressed forward on both sides. So a pawn storm will occur uh, because the pawns in front of your king, normally you don't want to move those. But now that uh, they've castled on the opposite side, the pawns can be thrown forward to help attack. So the king moves out of this half open file and rook to d1 is played. So interesting move. Um, that could put pressure here on this, this file and possibly at some point maybe attack this d7 bishop. But right now that's protected by this rook. Uh, so we'll have to see what happens here. Queen retreats back to b6 here. So possibly attacking this b pawn, but that could be a problem if black were to capture these pawns, then it might leave open files for the rooks to attack uh, up towards black's king here. And so the queen moves here uh, eyeing this rook, uh, possibly attacking this pawn so that the bishop will not move. Um, but let's see what happens next. So, interesting. A5 is played. So normally you don't want to push pawns in front of your king. But A5 is played, gaining more space, uh, possibly allowing the bishop to move to b4 and, and remain protected by this pawn. Um, the final rook that was not, the final piece that was not doing anything moves over to the c file here. And so this is an interesting game. This, this pawn has been unprotected, but like I said, uh, usually you don't want to capture pawns and leave uh, openings towards your king here. So like this, here we have a half open file where this rook jumps on the G file now aiming at the king here. And so that is ignored and the knight jumps up here to B3 where uh, it could support a pawn push here, um, could eventually attack this pawn. We'll see what happens or just jump back into the center. And so a4, attacking the knight. The knight attack, the attack on the knight is ignored, a counter attack on the queen. 
And so the queen moves, and now the knight jumps up into the center here. And then we have the rook moving over to help pile up on this C file. And so Tall defends this pawn by pushing forward. We have a capture en passant and then a recapture. And now the queen moves off of this uh, C file and over here where it attacks the queen on H4. So after queen exchange, we have a continuing pawn push here, uh, pushing this pawn up towards uh, Black's queen side and his king over here. And so now, uh, rook to g4. So what does this do? It brings the rook up where it can then possibly move laterally and uh, try and get some attack. If this knight moves, it could attack the pawn. And then b4, continuing to push pawns forward. And now the rook moves over uh, to help uh, defend the king. And if these pawns push forward to help fight back and stop these pawns, and there could be exchanges coming. And it happens. So the uh, pawn is pushed forward. And then we have a retreat by this bishop. And now uh, this rook moves up. Uh, getting ready possibly to prepare a doubling of rooks on the C file here. And so bishop to g7 is played. So just developing this bishop on this diagonal uh, can keep an eye on this e5 pawn. And now the rook swings over to the a file. So taking control of this a file and now bishop to e5 and we see now uh, the game has swung heavily in white's favor here and knight takes e5 and now we see plus 4.7 in white's favor so white should be winning now after rook captures we have knight to well if we go back and see if Yes, that is the best move there. So knight to d7 with check. And here Botvinnik resigns. And so we can look and see why he resigns here. It looks like king to c7 is the best move to just get out of the check. If a capture takes place, then we would have pawn captures attacking the rook. And then... Rook to d1 with check. Rook takes d1. And then rook to d8 blocking this pawn. Uh, but then the game could continue with rook back to a1. And then, let's see, rook takes d7. But already in this position, uh, white is ahead by a rook. So uh, I won't play that out further as... Uh, white should just be winning there, even though there are some extra pawns here. Still, that rook, extra rook, will be enough to win. And so if I go back to uh, this knight to d7 move, it looks like king to c7 was the best move. But then we could have b6. Interesting. The king will have to move again, and the computer likes d6. But then a capture here. And now the rook is under attack. And it looks like the best move would just be to capture. But then we have b8, queen. And so now... Uh, and that's a queening with check as well. So black is in check. He would have to uh, move his king. And let's see, what is best here? Um, it says not to capture that knight on d7. And that uh, king to e7 is best. 
So after that move, then you just have knight to e5, and white is just ahead in material once again. So anyway, that was an interesting game in the World Championship rematch. Even though Mikhail Tall won that game, he went on to lose uh, the rematch, so he lost his world title back to Mikhail Botvinnik, uh, whom he defeated the year prior. And so, very interesting. Uh, Tall was a great attacker, but I think health issues affected him throughout his career. And so, uh, who knows how great, or even more great, his career would have been without those health issues uh, constantly affecting him. Okay, well, I hope you all have enjoyed this 100 and 50th video for this channel, uh, which I began less than two months ago. And once again, I would like to thank all viewers and subscribers for supporting this channel. Uh, you all are amazing. Thank you very much. The channel is steadily growing, and who knows how far it'll go. So thank you very much. Um, thanks for your votes uh, for who you think was the greatest chess player of all time. And if you enjoy these videos, please like and subscribe, and feel free to leave comments or suggestions. Thank you, and have a great day.